So glad that you've made it here today. Um, I remember many years ago, I had the opportunity to live uh, part of the summer in Colorado. And I was there primarily to be a part of this study program that was based upon a, a European model called the Labrie Fellowship. And Labrie was started by a philosopher named Dr. Francis Schaeffer. And what you would do at Labrie in Switzerland, at the same one in Colorado, is you would, you would work half a day doing some manual labor, if you would, and then you'd study half a day, then you'd have discussions at night. So over the years uh, in Switzerland and in Colorado, Dr. Schaefer and people who modeled their ministry after them had many great conversations with people who'd been burned out on life or burned out on substance abuse or had intellectual questions. So many agnostics, atheists, etc., came to faith in God because of what Schaefer had done. So what I remember, though, about my time at this American Libri, it's what you call it, uh, was not the, the great conversations that I had and what I learned there, though that it was great, but it was the dogs. It, it was the dogs, okay? There were two dogs in the place on this property where we were staying there and having this time, and they were both chocolate labs, but they were different really different. One of the labs was named Shasta. And Shasta was, you know, had never seen an enemy in his life, right? He just faced the world as Creed saying years ago with paws wide open, right? Just waiting to be loved and taken care of and petted, which just was a very friendly, what I, we would say, happy dog. Now the other chocolate lab was named Snickers. Snickers was not that way. Snickers was almost like a rescue dog because Snickers, when you would come to him, he would kind of, like that, just kind of cower down in, in fear as if you were going to, you know, whack him on the head or something. Strange. Strange. But, but I remember taking away from that summer that, that whole concept of how, you know, Animals are, are some ways, they're, they're kind of like humans. I mean, we know that there's fear in the animal kingdom, in the animal world. It's probably instinctual. But there's also fear in the world that you and I live in. You know, some of it's instinctual, but some of our fear that we have is actually learned. And fear can be so pervasive in our lives, can it? To a point where I would say that most of us live our lives at times dominated by a sense of fear. A fear of getting sick, a fear of losing a loved one, a fear of rejection, a fear of not having what it takes. We live with this underlying sense of fear, of fear. So I've often asked myself the question and, and in talking and working with people for many decades now and doing what I do as a pastor, where do these fears come from? Why do we have so much fear and how do we begin to cope with that fear? I think those are legitimate questions. And what I've discovered is this, is that a lot of our fears stem from our relationship or lack of relationship with our fathers. And many times people have difficulty and problems connecting with God, understanding who God is, seeing God as a father because of the pain and hurt that they may have endured with their earthly father. Think about a friend of mine, Mark, who grew up in New York, and he had a dad who was uh, very distant. And he told me the story that when he was a young guy, I think in junior high or something, his dad was reading the newspaper. Kids, ask your parents later what that is. He's read, <laughs> reading a newspaper, and my friend said to his dad, he said, Dad, is there a God? And this guy's dad didn't put his newspaper down. He just simply said, no, no. And so from that day on, my friend Mark didn't believe in God. And he lived his life that way. He became driven to somehow, I guess, earn his dad's approval. And he became very successful 
in a worldly sense, in a financial sense, but he was absolutely empty. He was not a good dad, he was not a good husband, and he was incredibly unhappy. And a lot of that, if you could talk to him today, he would say stemmed back to his relationship or lack of a relationship with his father. It's interesting, um, a while back at Harvard, there was a guy who taught a course called The Question of God. And, and this course, he paralleled the lives. You can see that on the screen there, The Question of God slide. There it is. He paralleled the lives of C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud. And so Lewis and Freud both talked about the impact of your father upon your life and how your relationship to your father many times, not all the time, many times affects your relationship to connect with God. So if you had a, an abusive father or an absentee father, perhaps you'll start seeing God as an absentee God. He's not there or even abusive. Or maybe you had a passive father, perhaps without knowing it, to use a Freudian term, subconsciously you start projecting that passivity onto God himself. So both Lewis and Freud talked and wrote about this father connection and how our earthly fathers reflects, reflects and can damage in some sense or distort our relationship with God the Father. It's an interesting concept. Freud never got over that. Lewis did. Lewis spent half of his life as an atheist and the other half as a theist and a Christian. Freud never connected that. So a lot of our fear a lot of our anxiety, if you would, a lot of our hurts and pains in our life stem back, right? Stem back to that primal relationship we have with our fathers. So what was your father like? What was your father like? Did your father affirm you? Did your father give you a sense of security and protection? Or was your father distant? Or maybe your father was never there? And how is that affecting your perception of who God is today and your understanding as God, as father? Father wounds run deep. 40% of all children in America will grow up, grow up without a father in the home. Well over 50% of kids in our country will have to watch their parents go through a divorce. It's brutal, brutal. So the problem, I think, in our country today, one of the problems, if you want to go a little bit, look at it on a national level, is not racism run amok or white supremacists trying to take over the capital, though those are problems and issues in our country. The biggest problem is the lack of fathers. That's a problem. Dads not being dads. Fathers not adequately reflecting the character of God. And the fear, the fear that can instill in us. So, thank you for that good news, Pastor. So, what does the goat have to say to us? You say the goat. Yeah, the goat. The greatest of all time. No, we're not talking about Brady. The greatest of all time. The greatest chapter in the Bible, Romans 8. Of course, smack dab in the middle talks to us about the power and understanding of living out from the Father heart of God. Check it out. Romans 8 verse 14 says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. If you're led by God's Spirit, 
You're going to put to death those destructive patterns in your life. If you were here last week, we talked about death lizard. And you are a child of God. Verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Fear of God and his wrath, condemnation. Fear of what other people are gonna think about you. Fear of what's gonna happen in the future. No, we don't wanna live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. Check it out. And by him, we cry out, Abba, Father. Which Abba in Aramaic, you know, it means, you know, daddy. It's a term of endearment. If you're Italian, it means Papa, daddy, right? It means this God who created everything, this Elohim creator, this Yahweh, who's the, the, the essence of existence, is also through Christ and by his spirit, your Abba, Daddy, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's what God does for us in Christ. Christ reveals to us the father heart of God. He wants you to know him, not only as the almighty, powerful, holy God, but he wants you to know him as a loving, caring, passionate father. And I believe that God places that desire in our heart. We have a desire, we have a longing, a yearning to know and to know the embrace and affirmation of the Father heart of God. And that's why we have so much fear. That's why we carry around a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of other stuff we don't have time to talk about today. We carry that around because we just don't know that aspect of God. We've never pressed in to really understand that he is our father. And sometimes that you know, places people far, far away from God. So we need a, a change of how we perceive who God is. I think about that great book that came out years ago. Uh, it's it's, it's the, one of the best books on personal development and business I've ever read. It's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many of you read that book by Covey? Raise your hand. A lot of us have read that book. It's a great book. In that book, he talked about a term that became kind of business speak and vocabulary back in the 90s and the 2Ks. It was the term paradigm shift, right? Do you remember that term? Paradigm shift shift. What does that mean? A paradigm is a way of viewing the world. It's the way we see reality. So for example, physically, if I had on some pink sunglasses right now, I would see all of you as pink. If I had on some, you know, purple Jimi Hendrix sunglasses, I would see all of you in, 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 in purple. So Covey argued in his book, effectively, that we have these internal paradigms, these lenses by which we view the world. And he said, unless we have a paradigm shift, unless we change the way we view reality, then we're not gonna have a successful family, we're not gonna have a successful business, we're not gonna have a successful life. And that term, paradigm shift, became used all the time in business. I believe we need to have that kind of change, many of us, when it comes to our understanding of God. We need to see that God is, is, you know, he is above and beyond us. And at the same time, that God has a father heart for us. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, my idea, check out this quote. He said, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. He shatters it himself. He is the great iconoclast. Can we not say that this shattering is one of the marks of God's presence? All reality is iconoclastic. May God shatter 
your false concepts of who he is. May God shatter these false icons and idols of who we think God is and may replace that with his true character and his true nature that we might press in and know his father heart for us. It affects so much, so many areas of our life. Ran to a guy I hadn't seen in a while. He just graduated from college. I said, hey, Bill. Bill's not his name. How's it going? Great. You dating anybody? Yeah, I am. I'm dating, dating someone. And I hadn't seen this guy in a long time. Don't really know him that well. I said, well, tell me, how is her relationship with her dad? I, wow, that was prying. And he goes, but hey, I didn't have much time. I had to, you know, just get right to the point. Because why? I knew that his, the girl he's dating relationship to her earthly father would affect how their, their marriage. That's just how it is. So when we know the Father heart of God, it's my desire that you would know the Father heart of God, it changes everything, everything. Our understanding of who he is, our understanding of who we are. And when we hear our heavenly Father affirm us and say, hey, you've got what it takes I believe in you. I sent my son to die and to rise for you. I put his spirit inside of you. You're going to make it. You have a purpose for your life. When you hear God the Father bless you like that, it changes everything. When you know that God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's blood can cover you and give you new life and adopt you into his family, that changes everything. That God the Father has been pursuing you and will continue to pursue you no matter where you go and what you do, that changes everything. It's the Father heart of God. Going back to my friend Mark, who was, dad was reading the newspaper and told him, listen, there is no God. Mark's living the life, he's living a wild life, he's empty, he's lonely somehow. Someone invites him actually to this church. He walks down one of these aisles. He gave his heart to God in Christ. He moves from being an atheist to being a Christian. God radically changed his life. He became a great husband. He became a great dad. He became a man who led other men on how they could connect with God and know him as father. It radically changed his life. As he began to understand and know the father heart of God. How do we pray, Lord? Oh, pray like this, thou my wisest, though thou who sits up, no. Hey, there's a, there's a good old man upstairs. No, that's not what Jesus said. How do we pray? His followers want to know. He said, start like this. Our Father. Our Father. Don't live in fear. Don't live in fear. No matter what you're going through, no matter what the future looks like, don't live in fear. You have a heavenly Father who knows you, who loves you, who is with you, and you can cry out to him, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. The Father heart of God. And we've got to be careful here. It, it, you know, there, there are a lot of great dads I know, great fathers who have done everything right, and yet one of their kids or some of the kids are going to say, hey, I'm going to do my own thing. So it doesn't mean if you, you know, reflect God's character to your kids the best you can as a sinner, that everything's going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't mean that. It also doesn't mean, well, if you grew up in a home where your dad was abusive, your dad was alcoholic, or maybe your dad was in prison, that now you're doomed, right? You're doomed to have a bad marriage and a bad life and a bad family. It doesn't work that way. Some of the people I know in this church community right now had horrific fathers. Some of the people I know never knew their fathers, and they're incredible dads, they're incredible moms, and making an incredible impact in this church right now. But to do that, you've got to make a decision. Hey, I'm going to become the dad. 
I never had. I'm gonna become the dad I've never had by God's grace and by his power. And one of the ways you do that is by connecting with the Father heart of God. One of the ways you do that is getting around other fathers you know who are ahead of the game in you and ask them, what have you done as a father and as a dad? So all of us here, Men and women, no matter where you are, it means we need to connect to the Father heart of God. We need to know his embrace. We need to know that he accepts us. We need to know that we can go to our Father at any time, at any place, with any request, and we can lay it all out before him. We need to know the Father heart of God. At the same time, for those dads here, for those fathers here, through God's grace, and through his father heart, we can become the dad, perhaps that you never had. Christ, Christ reveals to us the father heart of God. He who was rich became poor for us. He who lived a perfect life was unjustly accused and died sacrificially in our place that we might be forgiven, that we might know our Father's love. He rose again to take away that fear of death. Abba, Father, he's with us. He never lets go. He's a strong, strong father. It's the father heart of God. You know, it's interesting. In Scripture, you don't, you don't see God in a hurry. You ever notice that? You don't see God in a hurry. You don't see God in, in the book of Genesis. I've got to really hurry up and make the heavens and the earth and the universe and the metaverse and the multiverse. I've really got to get this done because I'm busy. I'm God. I've got to do this right now. No. Spirits hovering over the waters. God says, let there be light, Boom. let there be day, let there be night. God is deliberate. And turn, over, turn over to the New Testament and the Gospels. You don't see Jesus just rushing around. He's in a hurry. He's so busy. I'm so busy. I'm Jesus. I've got three years for this purpose-driven life of mine. I've got to really get after it. I, you know, while I look at my schedule right now. I've got a, you know, a 7 a.m. Uh, meeting. You know, I've got to feed 5,000 people at 8 o'clock. Uh, I've got a 9 o'clock budget meeting with Judas. It's a mistake. I've got a, you know, a 10 o'clock anger management with Peter. I'm so busy. I am Jesus. I am No, you don't see Jesus moving like that. He only had three years to change the world. Three years, three years, three years. You see Jesus moving very deliberately, patiently. But Lord, there are thousands of people over here that need to be healed. Hey, let's go get in the boat and go to the other side. No, Jesus was not in a hurry. God is not in a hurry. Except for one story, one analogy, if you would. We can see someone symbolizing God do something that's unheard of, almost in Scripture and, and our knowledge of who God is in Christ. And that's when that son runs away from the father in fear. 
in fear that he's missing out, right? Uh, I'm just gonna miss out on the good life. So he just lives this wild life, this crazy life until he finally hits rock bottom. And when he hits rock bottom, he says, hey, I can go back to my father's house and at least I can become a servant and have some food to eat. So he goes back, he makes the trip, he gets the ticket, he goes back to his father's house. And it says his father, I imagine the father is waiting there at a porch. He sees his son, he's been waiting. The father's been waiting on his son to come home. He sees his son coming home and what does he do? He gets up and the father runs. God ran to meet his son who had come back home. And he said, my son, who I thought was dead, is alive. And he hugged him and embraced him and kissed him. And he showed him his father heart. Because when we see the father heart of God, we begin to understand the Father heart of God. It sets us free. And free. 